All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. It's a good-looking bunch of people tonight. Just looking around from up here. How you doing? Okay, how you doing? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, all right. It's a good night to be in the house of the Lord. Um, before I get into the message, I'm going to do a quick little announcement, kind of detailing the transition that's coming up. I'm sure some of you are interested. Um, we've obviously been growing at a pace that was uh, more rapid than foreseen. And uh, if any of you were last week, there was a little bit of a trouble. Uh, no room. So uh, we've been in a lot of prayer and a lot of deliberation, really, uh, over what we're to do. And plan A was to find a new space, a new building that was bigger, that would facilitate a single service. And we have simply not found that yet. Um, there's still things that we're always looking towards, and so that may be coming still in the next months. Uh, we're not sure. But uh, the time has come where we are too large. And uh, so starting, drum roll, <laughs> starting September 6th, 10th, <laughs> we are going to double services. Um, yes, it's exciting and it's also a little scary. I'll be honest, we've had hours worth of conversation regarding this. It changes a lot of things, puts stresses on new places, and really uh, this will be a first time for many of us. So um, we will be doing um, some surveys in the coming weeks, uh, probably be part of your connection cards that we'll ask you guys to fill out. And we're gonna be, we've been doing a lot of legwork and we're gonna include you in some of the legwork uh, to really uh, try to be as effective as we can. Uh, what it will look like, um, most likely as of now, uh, things will be finalized in the coming weeks is like a five o'clock and a seven o'clock. And uh, it will still be here. Uh, and then at the same time, we'll, we will still be looking for a new building. Um, so that is coming down the pike. Children's ministry to help clear space. Uh, starting next week, children will actually be having their own worship service so that they will be checking in before service at the booth and then going in there. So all parents of children, um, some of you I know have the kids, if you, you walk in late or something and the kids will just come straight in. Um, so now they will actually be uh, checking in and they'll be in there the entire time. And Jamie's excited. The kids are excited. They'll have kids worship. And uh, if you haven't seen the new logo, you should go check it out, too, after service. It's really awesome. Um, so they're excited. They're amped. Uh, but, and we'll have people out there reminding you next week, too. So that's really the only immediate change is next week. Kids will be in there. Uh, but in the coming weeks, uh, we will be um, going to double services. And we really do feel like it's, it's, it's what's in the Lord's heart We have through a lot of prayer. And I think it's going to bring a lot of health into this um, body and, and, you know, our hearts still to create families. And so we'll be detailing the whole strategy that we have of how to maintain intimacy and connection even as things grow. Uh, it's a real commitment we have not to sacrifice quality uh, on the altar of quantity. Um, so we want to creep the, the same DNA of what God's doing, and we believe it's a season of multiplication. So it's exciting, and we thank you for all the grace, the questions, concerns. Um, you can give them all to Susanna. Just joking. Um, uh, but you, uh, you obviously can, can bring them and, and just know that we're thinking and we're listening, and we've, uh, we've had conversations with many of you and probably will continue to do that. So sound good? Okay, I hope that's a yes, we're excited. It sounded kind of liffy, but uh, I'll give you time to process. I know change is hard. <laughs> okay, yeah, you didn't laugh, so I'm just going to start preaching, and hopefully you'll like that. If you have your Bibles, open them to John chapter 8. The last, I'm going to pick up, so I have been out for three weeks, uh, one of them being India, where I heard, uh, I guess I've been out two weeks, one being India, where uh, Nikki preached a wonderful message, I heard, amen, yeah, I haven't gotten to listen to it yet, because I've been sicker than a dog, and my head was hurting so bad, I didn't want to read or hear or listen to anything, so, it will happen soon, I heard amazing things, so thank you for blessing us, Nikki, uh, last week we shared testimonies, so, uh, Picking up to where we'd been, I've uh, been talking through the dynamic of power and purity and uh, more pointedly upon uh, the mandate we have of mission, what healthy mission looks like in the kingdom is a gospel of proclamation and demonstration. This is what Jesus uh, lived for us and then it's what he commissioned his disciples. There was a few weeks back, if you want to go, I talked about how uh, through four generations and then I, I traced it all throughout uh, the history of Christianity that there's always been uh, a remnant that has eff effectively embodied this um, commission of, of uh, proclamation and demonstration. So the gospel is preached and it's also demonstrated. 
Um, we saw this wonderfully in India. We've seen this happen wonderfully here. And it is the mandate that God's put upon our lives. And so the ministries that he's called us uniquely to, some in the church, mostly in the world, uh, are to be people of, the, of proclamation and demonstration. Uh, I talked the week before I left about the, the dynamic of dependence, that this does not flow through human autonomy or independence or our own power, but it flows through a self-emptying. Uh, Philippians 2.3 talks about uh, the humility of Christ and then uh, goes further to say that we, uh, like Christ, are to empty ourselves rather than taking on the form of God. Jesus emptied himself, became a servant, and then modeled this life and then told us to do the same thing like a branch on a vine, completely dependent upon the branch for the nutrient and the source and the life so that the fruit can flow through us. Are you following me? So uh, I kind of did the what of dependence that week, and I'm going to pick it up, and I'm going to talk about the how of dependence and what this actually looks like practically played out. So uh, the biggest point you're going to get from tonight is that dependence comes from living in the voice of God. Uh, in Deuteronomy, it talks about uh, God speaking retrospectively to Israel, who's just gone through the wilderness, and he says, uh, I brought you through the wilderness those 40 years, and your sandals didn't wear out, and you never went hungry. Um, and he said, so that. So this is an important thing to pick up. Like, who likes to live in the wilderness? Right? Anybody? No. Nobody really likes living in the wilderness. Uh, and so uh, if we don't want to live in the wilderness, I think it's important to learn the main lesson of the wilderness. Right? And here it is. So that man won't live by bread alone but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What is he using an analogy here? What is bread? How often do you need bread? Every day. Not just every day, like multiple times a day, right? Some of you like 12 times a day, right? Some of you on those special diets, you have like 12 little meals, you know what I'm talking about? Like how man doesn't live on bread alone. He lives on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So there's this, uh, there's this strong tie between dependence looks like connecting to what God is saying. And how often do you need to hear the voice of God according to this? Every day. When you say multiple times a day. If it's going to be my daily nourishment and the very thing that sustains and empowers me to be able to live this life, that is extremely dependent relationship upon the voice of God. Um, there's a few verses in the New Testament I just want to um, make to kind of further build this connection between dependence and the voice. Uh, John chapter 8, you should be there. Uh, it's 8 verses, uh, chap chapter 8, verse 28. And Jesus says, uh, and this is part B of the verse, says, I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative. So there's a statement of dependence. But I speak the things as the Father taught me. And then you can jump over to verse 38. Uh, he says, I speak the things which I've seen with my Father. And then, I'm, you don't need to go there because I haven't marked, so I'll go quicker. There's another verse in John chapter 12, verses 49 through 50. He says, for I did not speak on my own initiative... But the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Right? So there's this connection, and Jesus makes it all throughout John. I could pull a few more verses out. Between not just dependent upon the Father, but between dependence and then living in his voice. Right? And I want to use the voice because sometimes people say, well, that's the word of God. And I would say, absolutely, this is the main primary form of, of revelation. Uh, but the voice, the, the voice is the author of the book. It's not just the book itself. Right? And uh, Eugene Peterson says this, and I love it. He says the difference between the Bible and other books is that when you read books, you're in control. You can put them down. You can set them aside. You can kind of be thinking about other things as you're reading the pages. So, but it's not that way with the Bible. So when you're listening to the scriptures, so because the Bible reads you. And I really believe that the Bible is a window, and every time that we look at it, it's not so much about the words, but it's about the man that's speaking the words. And so even as we approach the scripture, uh, we are not reading the scripture because we're not in control. We're not in the power position. When you're listening to someone, they know if you're paying attention. They know if you're checking your iPhone when someone's speaking, that's one of my biggest pet peeves. I get annoyed and I get out of the conversation as quickly as I can, right? Because they're communicating to me. 
Because when you're listening, you're not in the control. You're not in power. You are completely in, in a, a, an inferior position. You're receiving from whoever is communicating. communicating. And so even when the Bible, I would say we need to hear the voice of God. It's not sufficient to just read the book. Right? And God speaks outside of the Bible as well, but it will not, uh, it will not uh, contradict the revelation of Scripture. All right, you following me? Okay. So I played violin. I had a pretty, uh, I had a pretty short but storied uh, tenure on the violin. <laughs> it wasn't storied. Uh, but uh, my brother said he used to hate hearing me lit, um, practice, so the day I quit was a very happy day in his life. But uh, I remember when you first start playing, you don't even know how to tune your instrument. And, you know, those things get, they get a little sharp or they get a little whatever the other side is, you know, dull. <laughs> As you can see, it was a real short tenure, uh, just a couple years. Um, but I remember one day I was trying to tune this thing. And you get the, you know, you're trying to tune it and get it back and it just like doesn't sound good. And I had a teacher and he, remember he came over me and he said, no, no, no. So that's not how you tune a violin. So the way you tune a violin, he's like, you have to let all the tension out. He's like, and then you can bring it back into tension. He's like, it's just the way it works. And that stuck with me for years. And I believe that as it pertains to living and walking in the voice of Jesus, uh, we often as Christians fall out of tune. Even though I just told you a theological statement for how we are to be dependent upon the voice of God, I have many people confess to me that I don't feel like I have any connection with the voice of God. I haven't heard him in a long time. And even when I did think I hear him, I still question if it was really him. Anybody relate to that? Right? So somewhere there's a difference between the scripture, and then our experience. And I believe that part of the maturing of the Christian, Christian walk is to bring our experience into alignment with the scripture. We use it as a mentor and a guide to bring us up into a new place of experience rather than using the experience to justify our, our lesser experience, right? Some people say, oh, I haven't heard God's voice, so that must not be true. I say, no, this is true. This is the scripture. Let's get your experience operating in this level. Amen? So, uh, we're out of tune. A lot of people are out of tune. And I believe that a lot of times, uh, I think this analogy of this, this violin is how God works with us as it pertains to connecting and having a very vital relationship with the voice of the Father. And so I've, tonight, I kind of want to take us on a journey. I want to let all the tension out. And then I'm going to bring us right back into tension. I think some of us are on different parts of this journey. And I'm hoping to create some type of movement uh, in your relationship and your connection with the voice of God. Does that sound good? All right. So the first, I'm going to let some tension out here. And I'm going to address, there's people that say, I feel like there's people that are very tightly wound. And they say, I don't hear from God. And for some reason, it's not necessarily taught, but it's something that is caught in a lot of Christian circles, is there's this perfectionism that falls upon Christians, that it's like, it's like there's so much tension, it's like, I don't know if I'm hearing from God, and then there's like this. At the same time, you're like a baby trying to learn his voice, there's like this pressure that you're supposed to be Tiger Woods your first time and be perfect at hearing the voice of God. Like, I cannot have a mistake. It must be perfectly the voice of God. Anybody relate to that? It's like, it's like, I've been walking with God just for a little bit, but I expect that I need to hear him perfectly, right? And I don't know where this comes from. I think it's just a performance mindset, and it's religious, and it's garbage, and it keeps people tight. And then people are trying so hard, just like I was trying so hard to tune this violin, but there's so much tension that you can't do it. It's just, it's like nothing feels fluid. It just jerks one way or another, back, back back, back, and you can't find it, and there's just a lot of frustration, and people just kind of camp out here sometimes. In this frustrated place, I don't hear God. And I just kind of want to let all the tension out, and I think this is what the Lord did with me, so I'm taking you into some of my own experience, and I'm going to use scripture as well. Um, but I'm going to let some tension out here, and I'm going to speak the truth to you, which is that you all hear God's voice extremely, extremely well. In fact, I believe that every person in this room, you actually hear the voice of God a lot better than you think you do or than you give yourself credit for. John 10, 27 says, I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and, I know my, and my own know me. And then in 10, 27, I read the wrong verse. It says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So if we're Christians, 
who are like little walking Jesuses, right? We're following Jesus, a disciple of Christ. He says, you can't follow me unless you hear my voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice, so they follow me. I remember when the Lord was really discipling me, teaching me his voice. I, had the, I kept saying, Lord, I need three confirmations. Give me three confirmations that this is you. Give me three. It was literally everything he said. Three confirmations. Three confirmations. Three. And it was like I was like, no, I'm just putting these confirmations out here. And I'll believe it's you once I got these confirmations. Right? And it sounded so spiritual. I thought I was being real biblical. And the Lord came to me one day. And he speaks to me. And this is one of the big moments of my life. He said, how many times do you hear like the devil speaking to you, Jordan? And I was like, oh, all the time. <laughs> he, was, and he was like, how do you know? And I was like, oh, because it's like lust makes me feel condemned. Da, 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 oh, I, anxiety, da, 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 da. He's like, so why don't you ask him for three confirmations? <laughs> this is when I knew I was hearing from God. I was like, I can't make that stuff up. And then he spoke to me and it was so convicting. He said, I am your father. He said, I formed you and I knit you and I made you to commune with me. He's like, quit doubting my voice. And I made a, I made a commitment to him that day. I will not, I will not doubt your voice anymore. Um, the truth for you, for every child of God, is that you uh, are, are given the hardwired commitment or equipment to hear him. You hear him so well. You hear him all the time. How does he speak? Through thoughts, through impressions, through emotions, through the scripture, through dreams, through visions, through nature, through other people, through the TV, through anything. He is speaking. He loves communication. He is the God who authored communication. Relationships are built upon interpersonal communication. If you don't communicate, you don't have relationship. And God so loved the world, he sent his only begotten son that he would die on a cross so that he could have relationship with you. How badly does he desire to speak? All right, and then Jesus says, well, I'm going to go, but don't worry. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and he's going to tell you everything that you need to know. He's going to disclose to you all things. Like God is a God of communication, and you are formed to receive from him. And so, like, I want you to, like, push all the other questions out. Some of you that have been bound here, like, just, re like, receive that you hear from God. And this is actually the truth, I think. I think sometimes we're actually more scared that we, scared that we are hearing from God than that we aren't. Because we're like, oh, crap, what if that all is God? Give that money. Do that. Take that risk. Pray for that person. Take that job. Do this, that. Right? What if it actually is him? Right? I think a lot of times there's more fear surrounding that than there is that I don't hear him. So it's kind of like, no, I don't think I hear God. And it's because we're actually afraid, oh, I think I hear him really well, and he kind of freaks me out. Because if I give up control, all of a sudden he's, he's reading me, right? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not reading the book anymore. I'm not holding it. Um, so you have permission to hear from God. That's the main thing I want to speak to anybody in this place. You have permission and you hear from him all the time. It says that you have the mind of Christ. How often are the thoughts you're thinking not, his, not yours, they're his, right? You don't know until you act on them. But my encouragement is just let yourself rest in this place that you hear from him really well. Act on it. I dare you. See what happens. I dare you. Double dog. Dare you. This is exciting. Okay. This is really good to let it all out. And I think it's letting it all out. That's what the Lord did. It was like, quit being a perfectionist. Let it all out and just kind of like, Oh, I hear from God. I'm just going to act on what comes. Right? Like I heard this story of a little kid once who was ministering with some older students. I think it was at Bethel Church maybe. And the little kid was like prophesying over these senior leaders and like reading their mail. And these students were like, who is this kid? Child prodigy? And he was like a second grader, I think. And they looked at him after this and go, how long have you been doing this? So this was my first time. And they, <laughs> they said... How, how do you do that? And he said, well, my teacher said God wants to use me, so I just figured whatever popped in my head was from God. <laughs> that's so cool, right? Like, that's amazing. Like, you're like God's kid. Just trust whatever pops in your head is from God, all right? Like, this is beautiful. I want, some of you need to stay right here for a season, and you need to just, like, learn. I really hear from God. You get confidence, okay? I, I do want to speak and say, this is still out of tune, Right? Like that string's not playing 
the A string or the E string when there's no tension, but some of us need a tension-free, performance-free environment to just like, ah, I hear from him, right? Then from here, God starts to bring us into, into tune, into alignment. And some of you, uh, I, wanna, I wanna speak into this now. Um, so turn, turn to John chapter seven. I'm gonna read a verse that I think is uh, very, very pertinent for this, this dynamic. And, and I, I wanna speak that this is very pertinent to once you believe you hear the voice of God. All right, this is, uh, it's, a, it's a process. So I'm speaking to people in different parts of the process. So once you believe I'm here, oh, I do, I hear. I've had experiences. I have some confidence that I'm hearing from him. All right, this is Jesus speaking. He's being challenged that what he's saying is not of God by the Pharisees. I'm gonna read a verse. I'll read the first part, the red letters of the verse before and then verse 17. He says, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak from myself. So they're, uh, they're approaching Jesus and his humanity in this moment. They're saying, you are not a man sent from God. You are not God, right? What you're saying is of the flesh. It's of man, okay? So it's a discernment issue here. And Jesus is saying, if anybody is willing to do my will, or did it say the Father's will? Did I watch it? Yeah, if anybody is willing to do his will, he will know whether the message is of God or if it's of man, if it's of the flesh. Right? How many people have asked the question before, was that me or was that God? You hear that reverb? <laughs> it's kind of cool. <laughs> Sounds like we're on a mountain. Okay, that's a common question. And Jesus is answering it right here. If anyone is willing to do his will, he'll know. So he's linking, again, surrender to discernment and hearing his voice. This is going to drive me crazy. Can we get this figured out? Huh? Is it one of these mics up here? Is it this guitar? <laughs> okay. I'll just maybe talk real quiet. Just kidding. He's linking what I talked about two weeks ago, kenosis, self-emptying. If anybody's will is to do his will. Not if anybody's will is to do their own will, to do their own thing, to be autonomous, to be independent, to be living in my own selfish ambition. No, once you empty these things and you become a clean vessel that is pure and holy and surrendered under the hand of God, you will have the discernment to begin to recognize my voice. That's what he's saying. Discernment will grow. You will learn to know who is God and what is not God, what is of this and what is of that once you enter into surrender. So again, it's dependence and the voice of God. Right? So the journey of coming into tune, into alignment, is the journey of self-emptying, of kenosis, of dependence, what we preached on uh, three weeks ago. Right? Because the reality is once we get here and we start recognizing I'm hearing God, we also start recognizing we're hearing other things too. We're hearing myself. I've got my own thoughts. I've got, I've got you know, maybe some, maybe some demonic influences. There is spiritual warfare. Right? Like there's a lot of thoughts going on. Right, and you start, and then this is the crisis that actually happens to a lot of people. This is another place that people get stuck. Is we have ambition, all of us, to a certain degree, that the Lord is can, on the process of sanctifying, on the process of removing from us. He's we're on a journey of self, of kenosis, of self emptying, of pouring ourselves out so that we can be filled with Him. What happens? Ambition is blinding and it's deafening. Right, and what happens with ambition? is we will hear God speak something, but then we will manipulate it to serve, to, to, to serve our own will, right? And I uh, could give you like 12 experiences where I did that. <laughs> My mother's laughing. Now she's laughing because she saw how painful it was for me. I took it, I had ambition in me. I had an authentic experience hearing the voice of God but I interpreted that experience through a lens of my own ambition, and so I lacked the discernment to know what was of God and what was of man. And then I walked down a path that ended in pain and brokenness. This is a crisis that many people experience. Oh, I hear God. God gives us this elementary school experience. I'm hearing God, and this is beautiful. For some of you, this is not, that's not demeaning to say it's elementary school. That's just the reality of where we're at. Poor in spirit, 
Blessed are those who learn, right? That's not in the Bible, but that's what it's saying, being a learner, <laughs> right? We want to be learners. Elementary school, we all went through for a reason. It did something in us. But when we're here, we're not, we're not still in maturity yet. We're still not in discernment. So we get here, we have these experiences, God speaking, then all of a sudden we have one. I heard God. I know I heard God. It ends in a tornado and an explosion, and your whole world falls apart, and you say, well, I was obeying God. I heard from God. Well, something's missing here. You got bad fruit from what you say came from a good source, right? And that's causes this question where you start answering, you start asking questions. Okay, why? Why did this not work out? I had to retrospectively look back at certain experiences and say, why did this happen? The Lord said, come back here and look. This happened because I said this. You interpret it to mean that. You walked this way. Because ambition is deafening. It actually distances us from the voice of God. Though he speaks it, it becomes veiled to us because it's manipulated in our own self-striving, in our own self-promotion, in our own lust to get our will accomplished, right? And these look spiritual and nice. These look like, oh, I want to be used by God to do this. That's what it was a lot of my mind were holy things, good things, but done in my own strength, in my own will, not surrendered unto the Lord. Right? So a lot of people get stuck because they have a bad experience where they heard God, it, it didn't work, it blew up, and then we say, well, I'm just making up voices. Well, the truth is, no, you just manipulated his, and he needs to teach you something. And so you need to go back to where you got stuck and let him teach you and refine you and show you those places because he has grace for you. This was like years <laughs> too many years of like crap did it again did it again did it again right uh where do i want to go here um i so the the we we want to have this mind in christ which is ours the same attitude that was in christ jesus which is though he was in the form of god he emptied himself right it's a humility um, not counting others, uh, counting others more important than yourselves, right? Not not living with selfish ambition, but counting others with more value than ourselves. That's Philippians two three. I just botched it, but you can read it later. It's in there. We're called to live in humility. We're called to self empty, and as we do this, we will grow in this discernment process. Um, and we, the Lord wants to bring us to a place where we are governed by the fear of the Lord. And for me, I think we're all uh, like, like horses, like wild horses. We have this beautiful potential and this strength and this wildness in us. And the Lord uh, has to put the wildness to death. And that's the sanctification process. That is the process of self-surrender and self-emptying. And it happens through his voice, and it's a progressive experience. And uh, when I say the fear of the Lord, some people have a real misunderstanding of what the fear of the Lord is. People say, well, that sounds scary. That sounds like fear. There's no fear in love. Perfect love cast out fear. Yes, perfect love cast out the fear of hell. We're not talking about the fear of hell. We're talking about the fear of the Lord. The best way that I can describe the fear of the Lord, because this is something we, we lost. Uh, we lost this in the fall. Uh, the fear of the Lord, has anybody seen the movie Tron? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, if you don't, it's okay. I'll describe it. It's like he makes this electronic world, right? And then it's like this whole story trying to get, he, he created it, the dad, and then the son, he like got stuck in it. So then the son's trying to get back. He finally finds him. He's like, oh, I'm stuck in this thing. And he's hiding because they, all the little robots want out of the electronic world to take over the real world, okay? That's a synopsis. So now you don't have to watch the movie. But uh, there's this scene where the son gets trapped in this like, and it's like there's a lot of like electronic music because it's an electronic world, right? And they're all in this world and there's all these people fighting. And then all of a sudden, like the creator who had been in hiding, the dad, like shows up on the scene and all the colors and the whole place change and the music changes and everybody stops. And they're like, the creator, the creator's here, right? That's the fear of the Lord, in that moment, it's like you tremble and you rejoice at the same time. And it is this 
all-consuming reverence for the creator, that God Almighty is in my midst right now, the one who spoke the stars of the galaxies into existence with one voice, with one breath, with one word of his mouth. The creator is in our midst. And this is something that we were created with, but it died in the fall. We lost the fear of the Lord. We lost this reverence for God, right? And what happens is God gets us his voice, and we're not walking in the fear of the Lord. Proverbs says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It says the fear of the Lord is pure. It says the fear of the Lord is clean. It's enduring, right? The fear of the Lord, we're designed to live with this capacity. It's wonder. It's where wonder comes from. This hanging on the edge of my seat. I cannot wait for the next word that's going to come from your mouth because it could change and it will change everything. Right? That is what surrender puts us into. That is the, post, the posture of dependence that we're called to live in. This place where the fear of the Lord is so upon us that I know I can't take one step that you're not going because that is not the path that I'm called to be on. It's Jesus, I can't do anything of my own initiative. I just do what I see the Father doing because Jesus lived a life possessed with the fear of the Lord. Right? And we have this independence in us, like it's like this wildness, like a wild Mustang. And God has to break that, and he breaks it with the fear of the Lord. And in its place, he puts the fear of the Lord. And so we say, oh, no, I want to roam around in independence and wildness. It's so cool. The pastures are so amazing. Right? It looks so wonderful outside. But we all know the end of the day, it's, it's empty. But with faith in the kingdom, God says, no, no, no. Come. Come into the stable. Let me teach you dependence, and I'll show you the fear of the Lord. And it's much better than all the enticements of independence. And it's found in the voice of God, and it's found progressively, step by step by step. And when that breaks and he, the fear of the Lord enters, you become a new creation. You become, uh, like, wired for dependence, and you begin to hear more clearly. Are you following me? Okay. Uh, Peter had this. He, he uh, had his own ambition. So Jesus spoke, I'm going to go to the cross and die. And he's like, no, 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 Lord, that's not going to work. <laughs> Why? Because that thing you're speaking doesn't meet my agenda. And Jesus is saying, you don't understand, Peter. It's about my agenda. It's so much better. I know it looks like it's going to be a death, but it's actually going to lead to a resurrection that's going to transform the history of humanity and open a door in the heavens for mankind to come back into right relationship with the Father. Do you see how stupid Peter's words feel now? That's how stupid each time we walk out of the fear of the Lord is. That's what God sees. He's like, if you only knew a small bit of my goodness, you would never go anywhere but other than what I'm saying. Following me? So we need the fear of the Lord. We need to yield ourselves to the fear of the Lord, surrender ourselves to the fear of the Lord, ask for the fear of the Lord to fill us. I pray all the time in the leadership of this church, as it pertains to this church, I say, God, govern us in your wisdom. Govern our thoughts in your wisdom. Govern our actions in your wisdom. So govern us in wisdom that everything we do is in a place of dependence and yielded upon the Father. Begin, fear the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. How do we know that we're not walking in the fear of the Lord? Because there's striving, because there's ambition, there's uh, restlessness. Hebrews 4, it's talking about uh, entering into the promised land rest of God. It says, uh, be diligent to enter into this rest. And it says, don't be like the Israelites of old. It says, who hardened their hearts. So it says, today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your heart. It says, and if there's a promise that enters, or a promise of entering his rest, and you haven't, you need to, like, kind of check yourself. Why are you hardened? Why is your heart hardened? Rest, peace, that's when you know you're living in the fear of the Lord because you're connected to the Prince of Peace and the God who has the rest. Um, we, I, I found in my life, just to give you some examples, um, where I have found myself deaf, uh, through ambition. A big one is empowerment. There's been times in ministry where I've seen God move. Then I go to 
operate in the same way and I don't feel his grace and I just feel this thing and I used to just push through it and I'd find myself extremely empty and feeling like I'm striving. There was one time in specific I had done some street ministry, seen God move powerfully, had dozens and dozens of people uh, at the street. I came back like a week or two later with the same, with a new group of people, wanted them to happen and I just was like off the whole night and about three months later I said, Lord, it was so discouraging. Like why was I so off? And he said, because you weren't listening to my voice. I said, I wanted you to empower your team. I wanted you to take a step back. And I've found that a number of times that whenever I find myself empty in ministry, it's often because the Lord takes me back and says, you missed my caution. You weren't obeying. You weren't listening to where I wanted to empower another voice, empower another person. So that's like a, a, a place that I have to look and be responsive to uh, in ministry, in life. Um, there was many times in preaching that uh, I would be preparing and I'd be like, ooh, that's going to sound really cool. I can't wait to make that point. Oh, it's going to be awesome, right? And I would get there, and it would be so dead and flat. And the Lord would be like, you, you, um, that was your will. It's like, I want you to preach my words. And, I, and I've just, I had to learn this discernment. It's the process. As you, anybody's willing to do his will, you'll know the teaching is my teaching is the Lord's. Um, you know, and I can go into details because it's no, no things too big, no things too small for the voice of God. There was a time I wanted to sell my car. The Lord said, no, I'd put it on Craigslist. The God had already bought it. And the Lord said, the guy's going to renege his offer, and you need to say no. You need to give him the money back. You're not selling your car. You didn't ask me. I was like, crap. So he did. Renege on his offer. I still drive it. So pray for me. There was like literally one time I wanted to pay my student loans off, and I literally clicked the button, and the Lord said, you need to uh, ask for that money back, cancel the payment. He's like, you didn't ask me. And I was like, crap. It's literally, like, I don't know why, but he didn't want me to. So we have to be responsive. There's nothing that is too big or too small to remove the need for the voice of God. It needs to be governed in the fear of the Lord. Um, this is the reality is that we will touch his glory if we are deaf to his voice as we grow into maturity. Uh, the Lord's not worried about this when we're over here with no tension, just learning his voice. Um, but as we grow into maturity, he becomes very concerned if you are deaf in moments because you can miss very significant things and you can create environments and ecosystems of, of unhealth that point to yourself because you missed what God was speaking. Moses, uh, people say, why did Moses get in so much trouble? All he did was slam a rock twice instead of once. Had nothing to do with slamming the rock. It had everything to do with that. He was an instrument of God and he was told, touch that rock one time. And he touched it two times, which is a message back to God that it's not about dependence upon you. It's about my own autonomy, my own independence and power. And the Lord has to thwart pride. And so this journey of coming to alignment is a, is a journey of learning to be so dependent that God can trust you using his power through you. And you will be so responsive and governed by the fear of the Lord and the wisdom of God that everything you do will point to the God of the ages and not to yourself. Are you following me? So it's real important that we just get this. And there is grace on this journey. And that's why it's a process of learning. Um, I do want to speak to this because we're not slaves. Uh, probably two or three months ago, I talked about the dynamic between servants and sons. And as we grow in obedience, we also grow in freedom. And so though there are no things too small for the voice of God to speak to, he does not speak to everything. Um, that's not what the Lord wants to create in us. Uh, and when God trusts our hearts, he will actually begin to throw decisions back upon us and say, what do you want to do? What do you think of this? And there'll be a conversation and maturity, and that's sonship, and that's a relationship um, with a father, um, that we would have an earthly father. As you grow into age, you begin to have much more say in the dynamic, right? Um, and so it's no different with the Lord, um, but I believe what it looks like to live independence, even in this place of given freedom, uh, freedom is within the context of dependence, and so it's still saying, like, my hands are open to everything, right? Like, every decision, my hands are open, Lord. What is your will? What do you have anything to say? If he's silent, I know that I have a choice, and, you know, and, and there's communication, and sometimes he throws it back on me. But initially, the posture of my heart in every way, and the way we lead this church, the way that I lead my, your personal lives, the way you lead your families, the way you do your work, the way you make decisions, the way is open-handed, Lord, I'm yielded. My ear is inclined to you. Are you speaking to this? Do you have anything to say? And he may not, and he may. Um, and there's, there's lots of freedom and permission, and you can listen to that other sermon to get more of that dynamic. But does that make sense?
I don't want you to be like, I'm waiting for God to tell me to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Lord, can I use six squares of toilet paper or nine? Right? Like, that's, that's not what I'm advocating here, okay? It's just, uh, it's just simply like the posture of your heart is yielded. Amen? All right. I think that's it. So I'm just going to end right there. And I want us to, I'm going to, the prayer I just want to pray tonight is uh, that God will govern us, that we'll be a people governed in wisdom. And uh, I think that's probably particularly in a time like this where we're in transition. Um, That would be my prayer request, that you can continue to pray for me, pray for the leadership team, pray for the staff, um, pray for all of us as a church, that we will be a people governed by wisdom. So I just want us to stand up. And then uh, if the band, you can come up and play some music, then we'll transition into ministry time. So you can, uh, you can probably dim the lights just a little bit. So I just want to uh, take one hand, put it on your head, and one hand, put it on your heart. Simon didn't say that, so you're all out. <laughs> I'm sorry, that was good. I'm pretty proud of myself right now. <laughs> Just gonna let that soak for a second. <laughs> oh Lord. Lord, we just ask that we will be a people that our minds will be governed in wisdom, God. That our hearts will be governed in wisdom, God. We want to be a people that live in the, the trembling and the rejoicing of the fear of the Lord. Lord, we ask that you, uh, you, you teach us and that you grow us. And wherever we are on this journey and this beautiful process of coming into alignment with your voice, I pray, God, that tonight you create movement, God, that you release tension in some, that you pull people into a greater place of alignment with your heart, Lord. But in all of these things, we ask that you govern us in wisdom, God. We pray that you govern our our homes, God, that you govern our finances, that you govern our, uh, our hopes and our futures, that you govern, God, the decisions that we're making, the big ones, the medium ones, and the large ones, God, that you govern Uh, us in our parenting, God, in our marriages, Lord, in our ministries, Lord, in every aspect of life, we want to be governed by your wisdom so that we can walk into the fullness of Christ. Lord, we pray this in your mighty name, and we thank you that when we ask for wisdom, James 2 says that you will give it, God. So we ask for wisdom tonight, and we open our hearts, and we receive it gladly because we know you love us. So we bless you and we honor you and we thank you in this house tonight. Amen. Amen.